Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's wonderful for me to be here in your presence. Um, my name is Marie. Uh, I'm a peace and security consultant. I'm also a senior advisor to Peace is Loud. I was previously director of research at the Institute for Inclusive Security and previously an editor and research fellow at the International Peace Institute. So a bit of a policy wonk too, I, I'll confess. Um, currently working on a film, which is very exciting. Uh, so I'm going to try to bring in some visuals here, not from films, mostly stills, uh, but really mostly digging into the policy wonk side. So I hope you can all stay with me. Please feel free to interrupt at any time. And, you know, I'd love this to really be a conversation as, as much as possible. Um, I have been asked also three questions. Uh, whoops, jumping ahead. How do armed groups exploit gender? How does a gender perspective impact conflict resolution and peace building? And we got the same third question, the million dollar question. Uh, how to overcome cultural, social, and institutional norms. That's the rough agenda. Uh, hopefully I won't take too long. I'd just like to start out um, by just asking like, what kind of parts of US government, security sector, et cetera, you guys are all working in. So uh, security sector folks, run and raise your hands. More po policy oriented government, yeah. Other things I'm missing, very significant things I'm sure. Education, Education and training, fantastic. Anyone else? Okay, great. Um, that's super helpful. So given where you sit and given you as distinct individuals and human beings, I'm just curious, what, what image comes into your mind when you think of conflict in Africa? Anyone? First, first image, conflict, Africa, war, Africa. Any volunteers? Yes. Um, child soldiers. Child soldiers, interesting. Anyone else? So if you Google it, these are the kind of images, certainly in the media, uh, that we get. And that, that often, I think, come into many people's minds when we think of conflict in Africa. Uh, obviously, media representation has a lot of improvement, uh, room for improvement in that regard, and I'm sure we all do. Um, but it's true that the majority of combatants, uh, the majority of those in armed groups in Africa are, are men. They're very often young men. Um, and it's interesting to kind of ask why. You know, the vast majority of men do not join armed groups. Absolutely not. Uh, but why is it that so many, uh, the vast majority of those who do take up arms are men and not women? I mean, this is, when we think about conflict drivers, we think about, you know, ethnic identities, we think about tribes, we think about economic inequality, how does that affect it? Uh, we might think about someone's religion, but we actually very rarely think, well, does it have any effect if, you know, they're a man or a woman? And obviously, if you stop to think about it, the vast majority of combatants are men. Why? Why is that? Cultural biases. Yeah, cultural biases. Gender norms. Gender norms. Yeah. Anyone else? Family structure. Family structure. Yeah. Yeah, I think all, all of these things play a big role um, that we often don't think about in our analysis of, of conflict and, and peace. But armed groups actually do think about this explicitly or implicitly. Um, and they exploit gender very effectively. And I'm just going to touch on three ways that they do that today. Recruitment, retention, and representation. But first, uh, just a little historical context. Um, armed groups in Africa, not the only ones to exploit gender. Uh, random example, Britain, World War I, if you are a man, you shall go to war. That is what the men should do. That is the societal expectation that we will place on you. Uh, there was even a project of 
uh, women with white feathers who would go around and pin a white feather on a man who had not signed up to go to war as a way to kind of publicly shame him. Uh, and these white feathers became symbols of cowardice, right? Kind of a, a form of emasculation. And even uh, children are, are used in, in this propaganda. Daddy, it says at the bottom, you can't see it. Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? You're no longer a child, you are a man. You should be at war. So th this, is, uh, this is not something new. We've seen this in, in recruitment propaganda from states and, and armed groups alike. Um, and, you know, the level, it, 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 often at different levels. What we're seeing today, however, is on a, is on a whole new level. Uh, today, we're seeing groups like ISIS, which, as you know, is present in many parts of Africa, from Somalia, Libya, Nigeria. They're taking the exploitation of gender in recruitment, in particular, to, to a whole new level. They're tapping into the fact, you know, that many men feel like they, they can't meet these traditional expectations of masculinity, whether that's serving as the primary breadwinner in the family or earning respect and honor in society or having access to their sexual partners of choice. ISIS recruitment campaigns frequently feature hyper-masculine imagery in which physical strength and aggressiveness are paramount. And then they offer a remedy to this perceived loss of significance a chance to join a brotherhood of fighters, a chance for glory through aggression and violence, a chance to authenticate their masculinity, and they will receive uh, sexual satisfaction in return as well. Sex slaves, wives, uh, virgins in heaven for martyrdom. So this is certainly not the only thing uh, driving violent extremism by any means, but there is a gender dimension to this. And ISIS exploits this when it targets young men and tries to lure them into their group. And they do it quite, a, quite effectively. And they're not the only ones. This approach is shared by many different kinds of extremist groups. There's a great book by the scholar Michael Kimmel that looks at the role of this, uh, both in uh, neo-Nazi extremism and, uh, and Islamist extremism and how a lot of it often shares this approach to gender. Again, you know, 99% of men do not consider joining extremist groups. But why, why is it that so many men do join? And I think that until we understand the role that gender and these twisted expectations of masculinity play in all of this, we can't really fully come to grips with the challenge, with the drivers, with the push and pull factors, um, or we can't come to grips with the solutions fully either. Um, so, you know, in, in online videos, for example, that ISIS uses in their recruitment, they often have women who have already gone and maybe married to ISIS fighters they have women in these videos saying, you're not a real man if you don't join. I, a woman, already have a gun. What is your excuse? And this line, what is your excuse, comes up a lot. And it comes from, it comes, uh, from women. It also uh, comes from children. So there are ISIS videos used for recruitment where you will see uh, young, uh, ISIS boys holding guns uh, and, the, and the tagline sort of will flash across, what's your excuse? So again, even a child is doing this. You, you know, what's your excuse, young man? And of course, it's not limited to men. There are many women that join ISIS, not as many as men. But ISIS also targets its recruitment of women in a gendered way. It creates this narrative that women in Western societies are not receiving the respect that they deserve. And that if you as a woman join ISIS, you will have a chance to play a foundational role 
in the caliphate, as a mother, as a wife, creating the next generation, but also often as a recruiter, for example, in that previous picture, as an informant, as a, an enforcer of the rules. It's obviously, you know, so contradictory in so many ways, but this is the narrative. And many women who join ISIS report joining because they wanted more dignity and autonomy, and that is what is sold to them. So armed groups, certainly extremist groups, are exploiting this in their retention tactics. Uh, in their recruitment tactics, rather. Let's, let's think about other kinds of armed groups. Uh, and let's move on to retention. So I think, has everyone heard of, you know, this term rape as a weapon of war? Is that a, is that a thing in your mind? Yeah. And maybe that's often what we think of when we think of gender insecurity. And it's a big problem, and it has been for a long time. Rape, and especially gang rape, increases significantly during war. Um, and significant rape was reported in two-thirds of civil wars between 1990 and 2012. The true proportion is likely much, much higher than that. Um, most victims of wartime rape are women, but men are also victims. It's harder to measure. It's less reported. And as you, I'm sure you know, international courts and tribunals handling wars in Sierra Leone, in Rwanda, in Bosnia have all actually made incredible legislative advances in making rape, crime against humanity, you know, uh, when it's systematic, when it's widespread, when it's conflict related, crime against humanity, war crime, and an act of genocide. So we've seen incredible legislative progress to some extent in realizing that rape in war isn't necessarily just this random byproduct as, you know, it's kind of collateral damage. Rape can be used in a very systematic way. And sometimes it's at that strategic level with the purpose of, for example, it might be related to the purpose of ethnic cleansing, like we saw in, in Bosnia and former Yugoslavia. Very often, it's used in a more tactical way as a means of socialization to create bonds between fighters, and especially we see it especially when the recruits have been forcibly recruited. So this is the amazing research of the Harvard scholar Dara K. Cohen. Her book Rape During Civil War looked at 91 major civil wars between 1990 and 2012. And what she found was that armed groups and state forces, it has to be said, in fact, state forces more often use it than armed groups, um, they use rape, especially gang rape, to create bonds of loyalty, especially among forcibly recruited fighters. Because forcibly recruited fighters are more likely to fear each other. They're less likely to trust each other. They've come from all these different places. And this is why ISIS uses it as well. They have recruits from all these different places, very often in the world, all these different backgrounds. They need, a, they need to find a form of force cohesion. And Professor Cohen says that the act of rape and the recounting of rape in the aftermath helps members to form social bonds and create troop cohesion necessary, necessary to survive during conflict. And it becomes part of the hazing process for new recruits. It helps to maintain social order among the members. It's public sexualized violence that communicates shared norms for the group, shared norms that have many different characteristics. Among them are shared norms of masculinity, strength, virility. And what we know is that in, in recent wars, about a third of states used forcible abduction to obtain fighters, press ganging in different shapes and forms. And about 22% of insurgent groups use forced recruitment. So these are the ones according to her uh, analysis, that are most likely to use this kind of gendered approach to uh, retaining members, socializing them when they, when they are forcibly recruited, and creating this sense of forced cohesion. So again, exploiting these gender dynamics in a way that's actually quite sophisticated and in a way that we don't always think about necessarily ourselves when we're analyzing a conflict and looking at 
the different dynamics that are going on. <clears throat> Third R, representation, recruitment, retention, representation. Um, representation. So I'm talking about representation here, firstly, kind of in, in the sense of symbolism. So as Shannon rightly mentioned, Boko Haram in Nigeria actually uses an unprecedented number of women as suicide bombers. Most of its suicide bombers are women. That is, that, that is a shock, right? It has shock value. It's not normal. People pay attention when that happens. That makes news headlines. It is symbolic. It's also maybe just has an element of pragmatism. When you can kidnap nearly 300 girls from one school in a Nigerian village, that's fodder for the front line. But it's also representation in another way, apart from symbolism. Extremist groups, armed groups, are exploiting the lack of women's representation in security forces. They know that women are more able to move freely without suspicion during conflict. They also know that women are severely underrepresented in most police forces and militaries around the world, whether those are national militaries or whether those are international peacekeeping troops. And they use that to great effect. Uh, Boko Haram is a great example of that. You know, as Shannon was saying initially, police forces weren't expecting a suicide bomb to come under a fully covered young woman or girl. At security checkpoints, uh, male police officers in conservative societies aren't able to do security checks on women who are covered. So if there's no female police officer at the security checkpoint, the woman who is fully covered can walk straight through. Armed groups know that and, and they're using that. So what does that mean for conflict resolution, peace building? If armed groups are doing this, uh, what does that mean for us? looking to improve security and improve peace. A lot of things. <laughs> um, let's, let's think about this in two ways, okay? How does a gender perspective impact conflict re resolution and peace building? This is kind of at the micro level. If you're to go back to your, to your work, you can kind of say, in my job, how can I apply this kind of gender lens? And one element might be as simple as, I might, not, I might not have seen a woman as a security threat, but in Nigeria right now, majority of suicide bombers, of Boko Haram suicide bombers are women. That is a valuable new piece of information. Very, you know, pretty basic uh, awareness of the security environment and, and the threats. If you were paying attention to the fact that Boko Haram had kidnapped almost 300 girls from a school, you know, you might you might be able to put two and two together. So realizing that you know, some of these things that you think are women's issues, you know, they are playing a role in the conflict as a whole. But there's obviously you know, a slightly bigger element too on the micro level. If we think about the push factors and the pull factors that we normally uh, analyze when we're thinking about why do people join armed groups? Why do they exit? If we're aware that gender can play a role among many other things in those push factors and pull factors, we can also start to design better programs that look at how do people exit these groups? When is the tipping point reached that people are willing to leave or want to leave? What does that look like in a demo disarmament, demobilization and reintegration program? So in Colombia, for example, uh, women make up 40% of FARC combatants, so another sort of unusually high proportion. Um, and many of them actually reported joining the FARC so that they could escape traditional roles that were expected of them in the home. They wanted the opportunity of leadership and autonomy that the FARC was offering them. But the reintegration programs are focusing on employment trainings as seamstresses and hairdressers for these women. So there's just one example of, like, is there a risk that someone will, will rejoin if you're offering them precisely what they joined for in the first place in a way, right? And the same would apply to men. 
uh, if, you know, if, if men were joining because in part they felt like I can't provide for my community or I'm not getting the honor and dignity that I deserve, what, what, uh, what, what does that mean for your reintegration program and for the kind of opportunities that you're creating or trying to create? Now, you know, basically this is just having a better understanding of the problem can also mean having a better understanding of the solution, right? But, but does it mean that we can simply kind of insert gender sensitive provisions into a peace agreement and, and voila, peace will finally endure? Sadly, no, that would be, that would be very easy, but obviously it's, it's not quite that simple in, in practice. A recent study actually shows that peace agreements with the most holistic references uh, to women and gender, they actually typically fail to be implemented overall because they're highly internationalized accords that lack real agreement from the conflict parties. So gender perspective is really important, uh, but we can't just uh, you know, add women and stir in, our, in the text of our policies. We need to live this. And that's where it comes to participation and inclusion. And if we come now to the sort of macro level of the question, um, you know, what role does this play in conflict resolution and peace building? Uh, th then that comes back to nothing about us without us. That's a case that's close to my heart, Northern Ireland. That was kind of the chant of the women who participated in the, in the Northern Irish peace process. They formed a coalition across party lines, across conflict divide, across sectarian coalition, and earned election into the peace process. And this idea of nothing about us without us, it's a chant that's heard around the world, really, when women seek to get involved in public decision making that will affect their lives, uh, and could be applied to many other groups. But what we're seeing is that on a macro level, when women are meaningfully included in peace processes, it helps the peace to last longer. And the evidence is mounting. Yet another scholarly article just published in peer-reviewed journal, International Interactions, uh, shows that analyzing 130 peace agreements signed between 1990 and 2014, the scholar Jana Krause from the University of Amsterdam and her colleagues, they found a robust correlation between women's direct participation in peace negotiations and the durability of peace. And what their research unpacked was this linkage between women in civil society groups and female signatories of peace agreements when they interact and meaningfully influence the peace process, the quality of the peace accords provisions increases and the likelihood that those provisions will be implemented also goes up. So what we're seeing is that when women participate in peace processes, there tend to be more provisions that relate to economic reform, social reform, meaningful political reform. So what we're having is we're just, these are people, <laughs> you know, women and men, there's more that unites them than divides them. But often, on average, people come with different perspectives. And women come to the peace table very often with different priorities. And that's influencing the content of the agreement. In the example of Northern Ireland, they came to the peace table talking about things that other groups were not talking about. They were talking about integrated education. The children of Northern Ireland were being educated separately. They were learning to hate each other. They said, this is at the root of the conflict. This is one of the root causes. And they got it into the peace agreement. And there were many other issues like that where uh, beyond focusing on territory or power, dividing political resources, very often what we see is women bringing um, other issues to the table, complementary issues, that very often are addressing issues of human security or you know, the deeper drivers of conflict. And so much of this research is showing that um, when they can secure these provisions and really meaningfully participate, an agreement is more likely to be reached and the agreement is more likely to last. In aggregate, these particular scholars found the agreements with women secretaries show an implementation rate of 76% compared to 64% for agreements without women. So 
there are interesting connections happening here. I think we don't know all the answers yet. Um, but this is an interesting trend that we're seeing uh, that still is very different from the trend that we're seeing in the research, still very different from what a lot of peace processes look like in practice. As Shannon mentioned earlier, the proportion of women who actually get to participate in, in peace processes is still very low. This is the uh, peace process in Mali. You can see it's, uh, I don't know if there's actually any, maybe there's a woman there in the background. Um, so still a lot of work to be done in, in that regard. Another element that Shannon touched on is um, conflict relapse. Does anyone know who's in this picture? Yes, yes, Salvakir Rik Mishar, South Sudan, um, president and rebel leader, and in the background, uh, president of Uganda, Museveni. This is obviously a current and very difficult case of, you know, constant conflict relapse, right? Uh, real struggle to find a durable peace for South Sudan since, since its independence. And, and obviously a long time before that too. This is, a, this is a challenge in conflicts all over the world. Conflict relapse, uh, the rate of conflict increased, the rate of conflict relapse increased every decade since the 1960s. In the 2000s, 90% of conflicts occurred in countries that were already recently affected by conflict. So this is, this is a real challenge. How do we get durable peace? Um, and what a lot of the other research is showing is on the, again, on the kind of more macro level, conflict is less likely to break out or to recur where women are treated as equals in their society and when they have more access to public policy making. So for example, an analysis of 58 conflict affected states between 1980 and 2003 found that when women are absent from parliament, the risk of conflict recurrence increases over time. But as their proportion in parliament rises, the risk of relapse decreases proportionally. And when 35% of the legislature is female, the risk of relapse is near zero. So, you know, these are cross-national surveys. Every case has its individual um, quirks. This is the Rwandan parliament as an example. Um, but there are plenty of studies that I could cite like this. Another cross-national study shows that higher levels of female representation in parliament reduces the risk of interstate war. Another one shows it reduces the risk of civil war. Another shows it reduces the risk of domestic human rights abuses. So what we're seeing is there's something there. There's something about, you know, diversity of who gets included, the complementarity of women and men working alongside each other, and the outcomes for peace and security. So if that is the case, how? How do we, how do we make this a reality? Um, and that is the million dollar question. Don't think there's any straightforward answers there. I loved Shannon's initial answer though of, really it's about attitudes of individuals. I mean, I think really all of this is about start close in. What are my own, and I'm saying this to myself, what are my own hidden biases, right? What am I doing? Um, but of course, there are also many other elements that we can more concretely discuss in the, in the professional setting. And, you know, gender analysis of the drivers of conflict, like we've been discussing, I think can play a big role in this. Some of the statistics, uh, statistical or quantitative research rather that I was citing also shows that, you know, more gender equality in society correlates with greater peace and security. So in fact, Valerie Hudson, uh, Texas A&M University scholar and her colleagues have shown that uh, gender equality is actually a greater predictor of peace than a country's wealth, than the type of religion it has or its level of democracy. And that's internal peace and external peace, countries' relations uh, with the international community, the likelihood that it will go to war. So more gender equality in society is probably also going to help this, this conundrum. 
Um, more women participating in, in peace and security institutions, as we were just discussing. More men championing gender sensitive inquiry. Uh, and then really, I think a lot of it is going to be about mass movements in society, working with policymakers, elites, people who are able to influence uh, some of the bigger decisions in, in public life and, and the interplay between the two. So let's, let's look at one case that kind of touches on some of these things. Um, let's see how much, time, how much time do I have left, Dr. Brico? Five minutes? Okay. Um, so, one case that illustrates some of these different dynamics uh, to some extent, and no, certainly no case is perfect and many challenges remain, but one very interesting case is Liberia. So, at the start of this year, Liberia experienced its first peaceful transfer of power in more than 70 years. Peace has held since 2003, which was, saw the end of almost two decades of brutal recurring civil war conflict cycles in Liberia. And many different factors contributing, contributed to ending the war and maintaining the peace. But the role of women and gender perspectives, different gender perspectives, uh, really ha had a big influence that isn't always um, part of the, the mainstream story. So in a society where so many of the cultural, social, and institutional barriers seem to be working against them, women actually did manage to influence the direction of the war and to bring a, a gender perspective into the, into the peace process. <clears throat> and I'm talking in particular about civil society, women's movements in civil society who were pro-peace groups. They started mass mobilization, uh, protests in the street, delivered sets of demands to the president, to the warring parties, conducted shuttle diplomacy between the two, and helped to pressure them to get to the peace table. They also then, that mass mobilization also helped other women's groups to get a seat at that table wasn't super significant, but they earned seats among, among the civil society delegates in the, in the peace talks. So women were acting then inside and outside the peace negotiations. They were sharing information. Um, when the talks stalled, women on the outside actually performed a sit-in, barricaded the doors, uh, and wouldn't let the negotiators out until they committed to reaching an agreement. The dynamic changed after that, and an agreement was reached within two weeks after months of drawn out talks. Um, after the agreement was signed, these women's civil society groups then created timelines and benchmarks to measure the implementation of the agreement. They raised awareness about what the agreement contained, which helped to embed it in society and create a sense of ownership. They also when the disarmament process stalled, because the combatants were actually refusing to disarm, they again leveraged their identity as, as mothers in society and approached the combatants who were refusing to disarm and persuaded them, kind of drawing on this again, which they had done throughout the protests, drawing on this sort of idea that they're above politics, they're neutral, drawing on, their, on that element of their identity as women to persuade the combatants to finally give up their arms. So the mediator in all of this was a general, General Abu Bakr. And I have a quote from him uh, that's in a film that you can watch online called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And he said, so he was the mediator in the peace process. He said, we took the opinion of the women with all seriousness. I found an ally in them. The belligerents had come to the point where they have captured the whole government of Liberia. So during the peace talks, they were talking about power, position, and job, control of resources. We on the mediation side felt the women were doing a good thing, trying to make the men see reason. They were going from one delegate to the other, from one hotel to the other, trying to influence the delegates. So we have all sorts of tactics here for overcoming these social, cultural 
institutional norms. They're using sort of nonviolent resistance tactics. They're using resistance, mass mobilization. They're using uh, shuttle diplomacy. But in particularly important, and this is a pattern that really repeats itself across peace processes uh, where women end up getting influences, they're using this insider-outsider approach. They're combining forces in civil society with champions who are inside the formal process, male and female, uh, to get gender provisions into the agreement, but also in their, in their push for peace. So there's a whole other story um, that I could tell you about, about how those networks of women then went on to get out the vote for the first elected female president in Africa. Um, and Liberia's story is, you know, it's obviously a complex one and the peace remains fragile, but it's, it's an incredible example where peace is, has held and there's a, a gender dimension to that and a great example of how a lot of those cultural and social norms were overcome. Even if you think more just on a policy sphere, how do you overcome institutional norms? Does anyone know what's happening here? Where is this? Security Council. Yes. UN Security Council, the year 2000. The members are passing Resolution 1325. How many people have heard of Resolution 1325? Interesting. Resolution 1325, year 2000 is the UN resolution uh, adopted by the Security Council that says women, that sets the entire agenda for what's called women, peace and security. Women should have a role in peace building, gender conflict affects women and men differently, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That, in the Security Council, which still has many members who are quite resistant to this idea that it should be involved in, in peace and security at all, that, that was overcoming a huge institutional hurdle uh, and a lot of social norms around what gets to be discussed in the Security Council and what will the countries in the Security Council agree on. And again there we saw these links between civil society pushing for the resolution and champions within the Security Council, in particular a male ambassador from Bangladesh who put it on the agenda. I could go on and I won't. I would love to hear your questions uh, and, and talk about this more. Thank you so much.